I get it. The risk analysis formulas for the CISSP exam are challenging, and half the problem is finding any material that will show you how to apply these formulas in an actual scenario. This is the video that fixes that. We will walk through a real world scenario, interpreting the information, applying the formulas, doing the math, and validating our results. This is 20 minutes you don't wanna miss. So today, by request, we're going to talk quantitative risk analysis formulas. We're gonna focus in on a real world example. There's no such thing as a perfect example, but I'm going to use a real world example that will help you to do the math, interpret the data as it might be uh, presented to you on the exam. But at the end of the day, I want you to master quantitative risk analysis formula. So that's all we're talking about here. Uh, if you don't already have the official CISSP exam study guide, um, I absolutely recommend you get a copy. It has a bunch of flashcards and practice questions that make it worth more than the 50 some odd dollars that it'll, it will cost you. And you can get it out on Amazon. Uh, and it all goes well with my CISSP exam prep strategy. I described how I uh, reduced my preparation time with some smart techniques, uh, memorization techniques, and uh, repetition. So let's just get right into risk analysis. So, so we're, we're focusing on quantitative risk analysis because that's where the formulas exist. Quantitative risk analysis assigns a dollar value. It is objective and it uses formulas. It uses math. There's going to be a lot of math on this uh, exam and that's what we're going to focus on today is the math around risk analysis. So in fact, if you look at the official CISSP study guide, you will find a chart of the six major elements of quantitative risk analysis. We need to understand asset value, exposure factor, single loss expectancy, annualized rate of occurrence, and annualized loss expectancy, as well as uh, being able to perform a cost-benefit analysis. And I numbered these steps because we're going to go through them, steps one through six, to arrive at our answer. And if you look at the official study guide, word for word, the study guide says the concepts you must know for the exam are asset value, exposure factor, single loss expectancy, annualized rate of occurrence, annualized loss expectancy, and the cost benefit formula. The same six items that are sitting right here, and we're going to cover them all. So before we, we tear into an example, I want to cover just some terms for you and touch on some of the formulas. Uh, so when I mention countermeasures or controls or safeguards, we can debate about uh, you know countermeasures being uh, reactionary and safeguards being proactive. Just consider these all equivalent terms for purposes of this discussion. So exposure factor. This is the percent of value an asset lost or, or might lose due to an incident, and it should be represented in a decimal in your formulas. What you'll find is it's often going to be given to you as a percentage in the question. So you need to know just right off the bat, you know, when you see that exposure factor expressed as a percentage, you need to know how to convert that percentage to a, a decimal. Single loss expectancy, how much would it cost if it happened just one time? So the single loss expectancy formula is the value of your asset times the exposure factor. So multiply asset value times exposure factor and you have the SLE. The annualized rate of occurrence, or ARO. So how many times does this uh, risk occur in one year? You want to be careful and watching for AROs that happen uh, over periods longer than one year. So in, in other words, for risks that occur less often than once per year, maybe once every five years, 10 years, 15 years. Likewise, uh, be familiar with how to do the math if a risk occurs multiple times per year. I'll touch on that. You'll, you'll know that math. And then annualized loss expectancy. How much will you lose per year? Uh, there are actually two formulas for ALE. I will explain why in just a moment. So there are some supporting terms we want to touch on here. So asset value is, is pretty simple. That's the monetary value of the asset. What, what is the dollar value? Safeguard evaluation. So safeguard evaluation is step six. It, it answers the question, is this safeguard cost effective? In other words, are we spending less on the safeguard than we are saving by 
uh, executing on that safeguard. And the controls gap, so that's the amount of risk reduced by implementing the safeguard. And the residual risk is the risk that remains even with all conceivable safeguards in place, because the reality is that not every safeguard is going to eliminate 100% of your risk. So that residual risk has a dollar value. We need to understand what that is because the, the controls gap and our, our, our risk factor into calculating the cost uh, effectiveness of our safeguards. So let me set the stage for you. There's no such thing as a perfect scenario, and this is not a perfect scenario, but it's one I believe you will understand and, and it will resonate as being uh, plausible. So the Contoso Corporation has an office building uh, that resides in a coastal city uh, where hurricanes have struck multiple times in the past. And the team must evaluate the risk and attempt to provide a cost-effective protection, a countermeasure, if possible. So the base numbers that we're given in this scenario are as follows. There's an office building that has a value of $1 million. Hurricane damage estimates in a single, in a single hurricane, uh, they're saying the building would, would be 50% damage. So it would sustain 50% damage of a possible 100%. And hurricane probability is about one hurricane is gonna, going to, uh, to strike land, to, to make landfall once every 10 years years. So we've been given some information here that we now must convert into uh, the numbers we need to complete our formulas, to do the math, to come up with our, uh, our risk analysis conclusions. So here we go. We have those six major elements of quantitative risk analysis. We're going to start at the top here. So asset value, we need to know asset value and we need to know exposure factor. These two numbers, asset value multiplied, asset value multiplied by the exposure factor equals our single loss expectancy. So let's go back to that information. So the office building value is is a million dollars. That's our asset value. So that's AV. Hurricane damage estimate, single occurrence 50%. That is our exposure factor. So let's go back here. Exposure factor should be uh, represented in a decimal, right? So our exposure factor was 50%. So if a hurricane will cause 50% damage to a building per occurrence, the exposure factor is 50% or uh, 0.5 if expressed as a decimal, which, which means that uh, 100% would be expressed as 1, 1 or 1 1.0. Okay, next, we've got our asset value. We have our exposure factor. Let's calculate our single loss expectancy. So if a hurricane happens one time to a million dollar building with a 50% exposure factor, single loss expectancy, a million dollars times 0.5, our exposure factor expressed as a decimal, $500,000. That is our SLE. So I'm going to pencil that in right there. I'm going to check that box. So we've already calculated the first three. We're doing really well and we're not even 10 minutes in here. So now we need to look at the annualized rate of occurrence. So let's go back and look at the information we were given on the problem. So it says hurricane probability is one every 10 years. This, is, this tells us how frequently it's, it's going to happen. So we can use this to uh, calculate our annualized rate of occurrence. So let's go do that now, and, and I mentioned you want to watch for AROs greater than one year, so this is one of those, right? So if it happens once every 10 years, the annual rate of occurrence is one occurrence, one time we see a hurricane, divided by 10 years, we have an ARO of 0.1. So it, we, we could see that something, uh, some risks go another direction, right? So let's say if a hurricane would occur twice every year, the annual rate of occurrence would be two hurricanes divided by one year. Uh, the, the ARO would be two. And if something happened once per year, the ARO would be one. So, so hopefully that helps clear up the math there. But what we're dealing with for our scenario is 0.1. We've got one hurricane occurrence every 10 years on average. So we have an ARO of 0.10. So we'll go back here. We're going to check that box and uh, just write in our... ARO there, which is 0.10. Step five, we need to calculate our annualized 
loss expectancy or ALE. And as I mentioned with annualized loss expectancy, you may see one of two formulas and you may immediately wonder why two formulas for ALE? Well, it depends on if you already know the single loss expectancy because that's part of the ALE formula. So the SLE is essentially asset value times exposure factor and the right the formula on the right simply accounts for not already having calculated the SLE. So so pretty simple there. We would really combine a couple of steps there. So We'll go the route of SLE times ARO because we've already calculated the SLE. So our solution is single loss expectancy, $500,000 times an annualized rate of occurrence of 0.1. That's one hurricane every 10 years. Gives us an ALE of $50,000. So we'll check that step off. We'll write in our answer. And now we need to look at cost benefit analysis. This is the step where we see the formula mentioned in the official study guide, it's called out that we need to understand how to complete this step, but there's not a good end-to-end -end example of this step. And I find it's left out in virtually every discussion of quantitative risk analysis uh, in CISSP articles and courses on the internet. So we're going to cover this together. You will know this, so we'll do the math, and then we will prove our work to show that we came to the right answer. A couple of supporting terms we need to understand first. One of these is the controls gap. This is the amount of risk that's reduced by implementing safeguards. It's the amount of money we're going to save. The residual risk is the, the leftover risk that's there that we can't get rid of through safeguards. This is money we're going to have to come out of pocket with uh, in a recovery scenario. So essentially, your total risk minus controls gap is the residual risk. Uh, that, that residual risk is part of our recovery cost. We have to come up with that money. The controls gap it will help us to calculate the value of our safeguard as well. So our company chooses to implement the following countermeasure. They buy an insurance policy to cover the risk of loss, and the policy has a $75,000 deductible. If you're not familiar with insurance, the deductible is the amount you have to come up with out of pocket uh, before the insurance company pays. So they're saying we'll pay everything over the first $75,000. So this is hard cost. That is residual risk effectively. So we take that $500,000 minus our controls gap, and our controls gap is the amount of risk that's reduced, right? So $500,000 minus $75,000, our residual risk, is 425. So, so basically we have a controls gap of $425,000 on, on total exposure there. And then $75,000 is what's left over. That's going to be residual risk in this case. So we have controls gap and we have residual risk. Make sense? If not, leave me a comment uh, below the video. I'm happy to discuss this with you one off. And if we were to annualize that cost, uh, $75,000 over 10 years based on that 0 .1, 0 0.1 ARO is about $7,500 a year then if we're annualizing to do the math. So our safeguard evaluation answers the question, is this safeguard cost effective? And, and know that term, the safeguard evaluation answers the question, is our safeguard cost effective? In other words, are we spending less on the safeguard than we are gaining in benefit? So the formula is, a, is annualized loss expectancy 1 minus annualized loss expectancy 2 minus ACS. Let me just break down that formula. So if the insurance policy costs $10,000 a year to calculate the value of the safeguard, this is the formula. Now, what the heck do these acronyms mean? I'm glad you asked. So ALE1 is the annualized loss expectancy before the safeguard. So that's that's essentially the full $500,000 of exposure, right? ALE2 is the annualized loss expectancy after the safeguard. So in the case of our insurance policy, it covers all but the first $75,000, right? So, so that's our ALE2. And then ACS is the annual cost of the safeguard. That is the $10,000 annual premium, the, the payment we make for that insurance. So if we do the math then, 
The insurance policy is $10,000 a year to calculate the value of the safeguard. We have our $50,000 annualized loss expectancy if we put no safeguard in place. After the sa- so, so after the safeguard, our annualized loss expectancy is $7,500. It's the annualized value of that, uh, of that deductible, right? So our deductible is, is $75,000 annualized at a rate of $7,500 a year. So, so $75,000 times the 0.1. The annual cost of the control is $10,000. So when I take $50,000 minus $7,500 minus $10,000, the value of my safeguard is $32,500. And that is to say that I am receiving an additional $32,500 in value over the $10,000 that I am paying for this safeguard. This number must always be greater than zero in order for this uh, countermeasure to be cost effective. And one could certainly argue, well, if it's zero, then we would still go ahead and buy that insurance, and, and you may well be right. But, but it needs to be you know, certainly zero or greater in order to have any argument that this is cost effective. So let's check our math. So we'll carry forward uh, the, the math we just did for our safeguard evaluation. So we said the value of our safeguard is $32,500. That's the value we're receiving over and above the, the annual $10,000 cost. So we've got $500,000 in total risk there minus uh, the $75,000 of residual risk equals a controls gap a risk reduction of $425,000. And one could certainly argue that the value of that insurance policy, you, you might want it to be a million dollars just in case, so, so we'd be looking for what we can cost effectively buy to go over and, and, be a, and above and beyond for a worst case scenario, right? So, so don't worry too much about that. This is a, a pretty solid example, I think. So the cost of our safeguard is $10,000, and its residual value, the, the incremental value we're receiving over that $10,000 is $32,500. So we add those two together, that's $42,500. I take that times 10 years, because if I, I'm, I'm calculating this over the annualized rate of occurrence, which is one hurricane every 10 years. So if I'm paying this premium and receiving this value for 10 years, the, the cost this number must not exceed my controls gap, the amount of risk that is reduced, right? So this simply confirms that yes, I am, so, so my cost plus my safeguard value times 10 years is 425,000, it's a match, right? It's, it's a match to the uh, controls gap, that confirms that in fact I am receiving $32,500 in incremental value above and beyond what I am spending on that safeguard. And now I've completed step six. So I've actually completed all of the steps that are listed as required knowledge for the CISSP exam. But what you've looked at here is the math you need to do, how the figures may be presented to you, and what information may not be presented to you. So, so you have some context now for, for how numbers may appear on the exam and the leap you have to take in each case to get to your answers. If you have any questions about risk analysis formulas, ask about it in a comment. Happy to cover any lingering questions at this point. I hope this video was helpful. That's it for this installment. Again, uh, make sure to give us a thumbs up if we're helping you out. Hit the notification bell if you want to get a heads up every time we drop a new video. But in any case, be well, stay safe, and I'll see you in the next one.